Hallelujah. I'm going to go to this scripture. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. And I'm going to go to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, Call upon me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And it reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. The title of my message is The First Thing That God Created. The very first thing that God created. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you today in the name of Jesus, led by the Holy Ghost. God, we ask you today to allow your presence to fall in this place. My God, we need your presence. My God, we need your presence. Allow your presence to fall in this room today. Hallelujah, and anoint me, God. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth. Allow these words to be seeds that get in these people's spirit to bring forth 100-fold. Hallelujah. God, we thank you and we praise you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah, you may be seated. Whew. I'm gonna tell you guys, this is gonna be a very heavy message. Listen to me, I'm gonna tell you, this is gonna be a very heavy message. It's all about that first scripture. I'm just telling you this now before we get into this. Jeremiah 33, three, call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that you do not know. Whew. I want to tell you what God told us. I want to tell you what God told me, what God showed me. After Apostle Don preached a sermon, I went to the bathroom. While I was walking back to the bathroom, God hit me so strong, so strong. God showed me how he felt about what he was telling me. I'm going to tell you how he felt. He felt vigorous, flaming, intense, eager, zealous, excited, passionate, committed, and dedicated for us to do this and for me to do this. What God showed me, it messed me up. I did not know how God felt about this. God is so excited for us to understand where he is at and what he wants to do with us. After God showed me that, I went to my seat now, when I was there, my dad asked me to help him with communion. He said, you do the bread, I'll do the wine. Now, when the time came for me to do the bread, I got up and told you about what God showed me. Do you guys remember that? That's when God said he wants us to become miracle-minded. 
Do you guys remember what I said? God wants us to be mirrored. That's what God showed me. God messed me up. That's the feelings he felt about what I'm telling you right now. He felt zealous, eager, intense, vigor, passionate. Commit. All these things were describing the way he, I mean, there's no words that can even describe what he shows me the way he shows it to me. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? God wants us to be miracle-minded Christians. God is a supernatural God. God wants us to be supernatural Christians. God wants us to do miracles, plural, every single day. Every day. It is about the purpose of a miracle. What is the purpose of a miracle? Now we know what God says in his word. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. That's what God's word says. God wants us to be healed and healthy. God wants us to fulfill our destiny. God wants us to fulfill our purpose. How can we fulfill our purpose if we're blind, if we're deaf, if we can't walk or if we have cancer? There are many problems that our body has and a miracle is the solution to that problem. So the purpose of a miracle is for us to be healed. That is true. But there is another purpose for a miracle. I want you guys to hear this. There is another purpose for a miracle. This is why God is so intense for us to do miracles every day. I'm going to tell you how you can do miracles every day. I'm going to give you some instructions on how to do miracles at the end of my message. But before I do that, I've got to show you the purpose of a miracle. A miracle is a supernatural thing. A miracle is something we can't explain. We know how it happens, but the world does not know it ha how it happens because they don't know God. They don't know anything about that miracle happens. So a miracle gets people's attention because it's supernatural. I want us to look at these scriptures. Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 11. Luke chapter 5, verse 4 through 11. And it reads, When he had stopped speaking... He said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets and let your net nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let the net down. I want to stop and show you something. He said, I will let the net one net. Look at what Jesus said. Launch out into the deep and let your nets plural. He said, let your nets down. Out of the respect for Jesus, he was going to go do this, but he did not believe he was going to catch anything. That's why he said, I'm going to take one net and put that net down. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net, their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. When the Bible tells us they forsook all, that means they left all those fish. Why did they leave all those fish? 
It's because they saw a miracle. I want to show you something about this text. Jesus got Peter's attention with a miracle. I'm going to say that again. Jesus got Peter's attention with a miracle. They caught more fish at the wrong time than they had ever caught at the right time. That was the most fish that they had ever seen. Jesus told Peter, from now on, you will catch men. I want to ask you a question. What kind of net is Peter going to use to catch men? What kind of net is Peter going to use to catch men? My God. I'm going to tell you what kind of net he's going to use. He is going to use the same net that Jesus used to catch him. A miracle. A miracle is what caught Peter. That miracle caught Peter. And that is going to be the net that Peter uses to catch these people. Do you guys hear what I'm saying? Miracle gets people's attention. I want you to look at this scripture. This is the day of Pentecost when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. Acts chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. And it reads, When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hear them in our own native language? They were speaking in tongues. When they were speaking in tongues, they were speaking a language that they did not know. That is a miracle. When those people saw that miracle, a crowd came together, and that's when Peter preached to them. That miracle gave Peter a platform. I want you guys to see this. That miracle gave Peter a platform. I'm going to show you the result of that miracle. Turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to that number that day. I want you to look at another scripture. Look at this scripture. Peter uses one miracle to talk to many people. And it was when the man was healed that was lame from birth, sitting at the gate called Beautiful. Acts chapter 3, verse 11. Acts chapter 3, verse 11. It reads, And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them. Miracles get people's attention. And when Peter got their attention, that is when he preached to them to get them saved. It is just one miracle that got everybody's attention. That miracle is a supernatural thing. The purpose of a miracle is to get people saved. I'm going to say that again. The purpose of a miracle is to get people saved. Listen, that's why God wants to use you to do miracles every day. God wants to use you to get people saved. That is why God is so intense about what he said. When somebody does a miracle, what does heaven do? I'm asking you a question. When somebody does a miracle, what does heaven do? Nothing. But when somebody gets saved, what does heaven do? All of heaven rejoices when one person, uno, when one person gets saved, all of heaven rejoices. It's because miracles are temporary, but salvation is eternal. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? The purpose of a miracle is for salvation as well as the miracle itself. There's a purpose in the miracle, but there's a higher purpose of a miracle. The, pur- the higher
entire purpose of a miracle is to get people saved. I'm going to show this to you. My God. That's why God wants to get people saved supernaturally through miracles. I'm going to say that again. God wants people to get saved supernaturally through miracles. Listen, Jesus got people saved through miracles supernaturally. When Jesus did miracles, that's why he turned a city upside down. Listen, people followed Jesus into the desert without any food. They were there for three days. They were out there because Jesus was doing miracles. That's why they followed him into the desert for three days without any food. The miracles catches people's attention. After three days, Jesus did a miracle to feed them with a few fish and some bread. If I had the time, I could take you through the Bible and show you that the purpose of a miracle is for salvation as well as for the miracle itself. If I had the time. I want to tell you about a man, a mighty man of God named Reinhard Bunke. This is the only man on earth that got the largest, of, the largest crowd of people together. There is no building on this earth. There is no edifice that can contain the people that he had. His church was a cord and a speaker. A cord and a speaker in a field. That was his church. Listen to this. 79 million people converted to Christianity as a result of his ministry. And I believe uh, I was told it was actually 91. I mean, I don't know which number's right, but I'm telling you, it's a lot of people. Isn't that a lot of people? It's a lot of people. So I want to tell you how his ministry began. Reinhard Bunke. His testimony so long I don't have the time to tell you everything about his testimony. His testimony is so amazing. I'm just going to tell you guys little points. I mean, I don't have the time, so I'm just going to highlight some points of his testimony. This man's testimony actually started with his grandfather before he was born. His grandfather owned a lot of stuff, but he was sick. He had a disease. He was laying in his bed, and he was in such pain where he moved, he screamed because he was in so much pain. So there's a guy, I believe it was Azusa. It was a revival they had in California. There was a man that was a part of it. I don't know his part of it, but this is a holy man of God. He got lost in a forest. When he got lost in the forest, he came out where there was a town, and God hit his spirit and said, you're not lost. I brung you here. There's something I want you to do. When he felt that in his spirit, there was a man standing near him, and he said, hey, listen, is there anybody sick in this town? This guy said, oh, yes, there is somebody sick. I'm going to show you how sick he is. I want you to take your hands and cup your ears like this. In a couple of minutes, you're going to hear him scream. They did that. They, he took his hands. He went like this, and he could hear this guy across town screaming. So this guy said he needs some help. Do you think he would mind if I go and pray for him? Actually, his son was hanging out with that guy. His son is Reinhard Bunke's dad. He was 17 year old and he had his bicycle with him. He said, go tell your father somebody's gonna come to pray for him. Now listen, everybody in his family was not saved. Nobody believed in Jesus. I'm gonna tell you what happened. When this guy came to his house, the way Reinhard Bunke says it, he says he came to them like a flaming torch. That's how he came to this person's house like a flaming torch. I believe that's because God told him, you're here on a mission. There's an assignment. You didn't get lost. I made you to get lost for you to come to this place. You hear what I'm saying? He came to that person's house like a flaming torch. Deals with faith. Listen to this. When he got to this guy's house, he started to preach to them the gospel. Somehow in the course of all that happening, this man was miraculously healed. They said his uh, wrists were so swollen, all that swelling went back. Every part of his body that was messed up, it was miraculously healed. All the pain was gone. Now listen, 
Reinhard Bunke's grandfather got everybody in his family saved because he was in so much pain. That one miracle caused him to be so appreciative for a supernatural God. Yes, everybody in his family got saved. Now, I want to show you this. I'm just going to keep fast forwarding. There's so many things I can tell you about this guy, but I'm just going to keep fast forwarding. When Reinhard Bunke was about 10 years old, he was at church and this guy preached and he was giving the benediction. He's about to let everybody go to the effect where he, his mom and his dad were at the door about to walk out. Before they did, this guy said, there's a woman that wants to share something with you guys. This little old woman got up on the stage and this is what she said. She said, I've had a vision from God. God showed me a little white boy. And this little white boy had all these black people around him. And he had some bread. He was giving the bread to these people. When he did that, the bread was multiplying. And that little boy that I saw is him. And she pointed Reinhard Bunky out. Now I'm going to keep fast forwarding, fast forwarding. This guy's testimony is so large. I'm going to tell you what ended up happening. He got married and he actually went to Africa with his wife. When he got there, he had a guitar. My God, this guy had a guitar. He would play a guitar to get a group of people together. When they were together, he put his guitar down. He picked his Bible up and he started to preach to them. There were not a little, listen to this, I know that's amazing. That's how his ministry literally started. He had a guitar in Africa with his wife. He's a young guy. He would play the guitar to get a group of people together. When he had the group of people together, he put the guitar down. He picked up the bike, I mean, picked up the Bible, started to preach to these people. He did that one time. Five people came when he was playing the guitar. He put, he put the guitar down, got his Bible. He preached to them, and one person got saved. That's a blessing. But I'm telling you, in his spirit, he felt like there was something so much bigger. There's something just so much bigger. Now, I'm going to keep fast forwarding his testimony. There was a point in time where he had this stadium. It was a 100,000 person stadium. This stadium actually looks like FedEx Field. FedEx Field is a humongous stadium. You, you know what I'm saying? It was a stadium about that big or bigger, and he was going to have a service in this stadium. The first day, I want you guys to hear this. The very first day of that meeting, there was exactly 100 people. I want you to hear this. It's a 100,000 person stadium, and you've got 100 people in that stadium to meet them. Doesn't that look crazy? He got upset, he said, God, what is this? God basically told him, you do the preaching, I'm gonna do the filling. I'm gonna fill this place up, you just go and preach. That's what God told him. I want to show you what happened. Here he is. He's preaching to these people. He said 10 minutes after he started speaking, this woman was screaming, I'm healed, I'm healed. He said four people had a miraculous miracle. One, per one woman was blind, she received sight. There was somebody that was lame and couldn't walk. He was dancing, jumping up, shouting, praising God. Four people. The first day was 100 people. Four people had miracles. I'm going to fast forward to the end of that week. At the end of the week, the first day there was 100 people. By the time the week was up, that stadium was packed. 100,000 people. God started it with 100 people. By the time the week was done, that entire stadium was packed. I'm going to tell you this right now. At the end of his ministry, there was no edifice, a court and a speaker in a humongous field, there were millions of people. Listen to this. He actually said he had California to make those speakers. Those speakers had to carry a sound about a mile long. Millions of people. They said that speaker is the most powerfulest speaker that was ever made on earth because that's the largest group of people that has ever been together on earth. This is Reinhard Bunke. I want to ask you a question. How did his ministry start? With a miracle. Do you understand what I'm saying? It was a miracle that God used to bring all these people together. Look at T.L. Osborne. The same thing that happened with him happened with this guy. Miracles gets people's attention. 
The purpose of a miracle is to get people saved. I hope you all hear what I'm saying to you. <sighs> now I'm going to break this down. My God. I'm going to tell you something. The only problem we have that stops us from doing miracles is our faith. F-A-I-T-H. Your mind is the only thing that is holding your spirit back to becoming supernatural. Your mind is the only thing that is holding your spirit back and your spirit wants to be supernatural. God, I hope you guys can hear what I'm saying. God wants us to have a revival. And this is how that revival starts, is by us doing miracles in our lives every day to get people saved. Faith is the currency of heaven. There are angels in heaven right now that are waiting for somebody to have faith. When we have faith, we put those angels to work. When somebody has faith, God sends his angels to perform his word. When somebody gets healed, there are angels in the room. It's that simple. The only problem we have is with our faith. Now, I'm going to show you something about faith that is going to help you out. I'm going to show you how to make your faith work where it will not fail. The just shall live by faith. Faith without works is dead. Faith works by love. I'm going to say that again. Faith works by love. Faith works by God. Listen, I'm going to show you what that means when it says faith works by love. But before I show you that, I'm going to show you something about God. Here we go. I am going to give you the greatest revelation that God has given to me about himself. I'm going to tell you something about God that you've never heard before. This revelation is about the first thing that God created and how God created it. The first thing that God created is the greatest thing that God has ever created. Everything else that God creates comes from the first thing that God created. The first thing is the greatest thing. Now I must lay a foundation before I can give you this revelation. God gave me this revelation about 14 years ago. There's only one person that I told this revelation to, and that person is Apostle Don Mears. I'm gonna tell you why I only told him about this revelation. It's because this revelation is so deep it's so heavy, it's so thick, that if I tell somebody else about this revelation, they're probably going to think I'm crazy. My dad did not think I was crazy. He told me, that's a good revelation. <laughs> when I was putting this message together, I felt in my spirit that the Lord wanted me to share this revelation with you. Now, I had some problems with that. So this is what God did. God added some things to this revelation, and he gave me a scripture to back this revelation up. John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, when I came to church last Sunday, and I saw him holding that bottle up, and he said, this bottle is God, and he poured some water into a glass and he said, this glass is Jesus. Y'all remember that? He said, God is the source 
But Jesus is the resource. You remember that? God is the source. Jesus is the resource. Now that is when I knew without a doubt that God wanted me to share this revelation with you. Because what he was saying, it deals with this revelation. As well as that, when I was putting this message together, God reminded me about a book that I read a year ago. The author of this book, his name is Miles Monroe. That is no coincidence. This book is called In Pursuit of Purpose. Now, when I reread the part of the book that I was thinking about, this book talks about this revelation. So I'm going to go through this book, then I'm going to talk to you about what we saw last Sunday, and then I'm going to give you this revelation. So bear with me. Here's the pages out of this man's book. I'm just going to read it. It's six pages. I'm going to read these pages to you. The birth of God's firstborn. To understand God's purpose behind the creation of the world, we must look at his first act of creation. The book of Proverbs describes this first work of God's creative power. By wisdom, the Lord laid the earth foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. Proverbs 3, 19 through 20. The Lord brought me wisdom forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. I mean, this, 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 this thing right here messes me up. I was given birth. Then I was continuously at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing in his presence, rejoicing in his word and delighted in mankind. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. Paul's first letter to Corinthian church where he refers to Christ as the wisdom of God. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who he has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. He has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. The Gospel of John, this is, this is his book, the Gospel of John gives this created being at his side another name. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not recognize him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. The scriptures are clear that the firstborn of God is none other than Christ, who took on human flesh in the person of Jesus. Now, I actually added this scripture to what he's saying. John chapter 17, verse 4 through 5. John chapter 17, verse 4 through 5. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. My revelation is about that scripture. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Now I want to look at something that we read. 
The Lord brought me wisdom forth as the first of his works before his deeds of old. I was formed long ages ago at the very beginning when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. Where there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Then I was continuously at his side. I want us to look at this. I was given birth, then I was continuously at his side. I was given birth, then I was continuously at his side. Now I want to go to the scripture that God gave to me. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I want you to think about these words. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. I want to show you guys this. I'm with you, but I am you. Now, I am you, but I'm with you. So, I'm with you, but I am you. I am you, but I'm with you. So, before he was with God, before, so, before, so before he was with God, I, I'm, I'm trying to show you some things. There's something that my dad, I, I'm going to show you this really quickly. My dad showed us something last Sunday. So before he was with God, he was God. Last Sunday, my dad showed us something with these cups. I'm going to show you what he said. This cup is God. God alone all by himself. God takes a part of himself and he pours that part into this glass. This is the source. This is the resource. As of right now, he's with him. But... He is him. Do y'all see that? It is him. But as of right now, he's with him. Now, when he was with him, Jesus' disciples asked him this question. Show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus basically said, how long have I been with you? If you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. Y'all get that? All right, now, now. <laughs> now, there's one thing I want to tell you before I give you this revelation. It's something my dad said last Sunday. He said, at one point, God was not a father. I'm going to add something to that statement. At one point in eternity, God was not love. I'm going to tell you what God did. I want you guys to look at me. Before the earth was created, there was God. There was God. Before the sun, the moon, and the stars were created, there was God. Before the galaxies and the universe was created, there was God. Listen, before any angels were created and before heaven was created, there was God. There was one God all by himself. I'm going to show you what he did. I want you to see this. Inside of God, inside of him, there is a part of God, and that part of God is God. Inside of God, there is a part of God, and we call that part the Word. This is what God did. God took that part of himself, he separated himself from himself, to be able to relate to himself in a different kind of way. Now listen to this. When God did that, God did that again. I want you guys to look at me. Inside of God, 
inside of him. Listen to this. Inside of God, there is a part of God. And that part of God is God. Inside of God, there is a part of God. And we call that part the spirit. God took that part of himself. He separated himself from himself to be able to relate to himself in a different kind of way. I want you guys to see this. God took a part of himself. He separated himself, the word, from himself, the spirit, to be able to relate to himself in a different kind of way. Listen, listen. When God did that, that is when and that is how God became love. My God. I'm trying to give you this. That's how God became love. Listen to this. I'm going to tell you how God created love. This thing's going to hit your spirit. God became love with himself, for himself, to himself, and through himself. That's how God created love. I'm going to say that again. God created love with himself, for himself, to himself, and through himself. That's how God created love. My God. God became love all by himself in a different kind of way. I want you to know what love is. Love gives. Faith believes, but love gives. That is what love is. When God was just one God, he was not love. But when God became the triune being, that is when and that is how God became love. When God did that, that is when God became the Father. How do you know that? It's what the scripture says. I was given birth, then I was consistently at his side. When your baby is born, that's when we call you the Father. God became love and the Father at the same time. Now I'm going to tell you, listen to this. I'm going to tell you the greatest thing about this revelation. Love. L-O-V-E. Love. Love is the first thing that God created. And love is the greatest thing that God created. It is love. Love is the only reason that God created everything else. Love is the only reason to live. Without love, you're nothing. God is love. That is what he is. Listen, love is the glory that Jesus was talking about in that scripture. Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. God's glory is love. That's what his glory is. God's glory is love. God's glory is the first thing that he created. Love. I want to tell you something. The relationship that the father the Son and the Holy Spirit has right now is the highest relationship that exists. The love that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit has for one another, one another is the highest love that exists right now. God has created us to be the wife of his Son. I'm going to say that again. God has created us to be the wife of his son. When we get married to Jesus, we're going to become one with him. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31 and 32. Ephesians chapter 5, 
verse 31 and 32. And it reads, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. What is he saying? What is this great mystery? He is saying we're going to become one with God. That means we're going to become one with God when we become one with Jesus. That means we're going to do what Jesus does. What does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? I'm asking you guys this question. What does Jesus do? Jesus creates things. I want you to hear this. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. I believe God is going to use us to create things in eternity because that is what Jesus does. We're going to become one with Jesus. That means we're going to become one with love. L-O-V-E. God is inviting us to be a part of the first thing that he has created. I'm going to say that again till this thing gets into your spirit. God is inviting us to be a part of the first thing that God has created. Now, I want to take this revelation and I want to apply it to our lives. Faith works by love. Faith works by love. What does that mean that faith works by love? If you love God, then you will work your faith. Faith without works is dead. Love has got to be the motivation of your faith. When love is the motivation of your faith, that is when love will put a fire in your faith. Love will put a fire in your faith. Because love never fails. Your faith will never fail. If love puts that fire in your faith, your faith will never fail. God wants you to put a fire in your faith so your faith will not fail. I want you to hear this. Your father wants a fire in your faith. Your father wants a fire in your faith by love. When that fire gets in your faith, that is when you're going to do miracles, plural, every single day. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely ye have received, freely give. Now in closing, I'm going to tell you how to perform miracles. You guys may want to write this down. It is very simple. It's very simple. Number one, to perform miracles, number one, you have got to have the right motive. Your motive has to be right. Your motive must be to get people saved. That's number one. Number two, you have to be in the right condition by feeding your spirit every day. I'm going to say that again. You have to be in the right condition by feeding your spirit every day. I'm going to tell you how to feed your spirit. There are three things that you can do. If you do these three things, your spirit is going to be fed. Number one, by reading and confessing the Bible every day. That's number one by reading and confessing the Bible every day. Number two, praying in tongues. When you pray in tongues, that does nothing but build your spirit. Speaking in tongues do nothing but build your spirit up. Number three, praising and worshiping God every day. When you praise God and you worship God, you get into his presence. 
When you get into his presence, it's like when your car is on E and that light comes on, you take it to a gas station. You put that pump in the tank and that thing is just filling that. That's what happens when you're in the presence of God. God is filling you with what it is that he has for you. You feel me? You just feel that stress and that anxiety just fades away when you get in God's presence. My God, when you get in God's presence, you feel like a brand new man. Amen? Amen. Those are the three things that you have to do to feed your spirit. Speaking and confessing the Bible, praying in tongues, and praising and worshiping God. Number three, when your spirit has been fed and full, there will be a faith like a fire that is burning in your heart that must do something for God. I don't know about you, I'm telling you right now, when I feed my spirit, I'm taken over by this faith. Faith is an action word. It's a verb. Faith does stuff. When you feed your spirit and that faith is in you, you just feel like I've got to do something for God. Do you hear me? I've got to do something for God. That's how you're going to feel. When you feel like that, you have to pray this prayer. Ask not, receive not. You have to pray this prayer when you're at that state. God, I want you to show me somebody that you can use me to do a miracle for them. When God shows you that person, then you have to release your faith with some fire. You have to release your faith with some fire. You understand? This is how you do these miracles. Listen to this. Number four is the most important point. After God uses you to do a miracle for somebody, then you must get that person saved. That is why God pointed that person out. This is the only step that is going to make heaven rejoice. That's where it's at. Number four. Number five is very important. Somebody just got saved. It's like a little baby. After they get saved, you should get them into a church where they can continue this new relationship with God. If that means that you must bring them, then bring them. It is your mission. It is your mission to make sure that they get to church until they get hooked and then you're done. This is the reason that God wants us to become miracle-minded, radical, fire-filled, crazy Christians. It is going to get some people saved like never before. If you will do this with faith, that God will use you to do this, then this will change your life. You are going to become addicted to God. This is how you build God's kingdom. My God. Hallelujah. If you guys receive this message, I want you guys to give God a crazy praise right now. Hallelujah. Because of your financial contributions, Evangel Cathedral is able to spread the gospel to so many people within our surrounding community and world. For your convenience, we've made it easy for you to donate online or by phone. To give online, go to evangelcathedral.net. Click on Give. You can give a one-time donation or set up recurring donations. You also have the option to give your tithes to the building fund, seed offering, missions, or to Revival and Evangel. You can also give via text messaging. To begin using this texting option, text Evangel Cathedral to 77977 to receive a link. With PushPay, there's no need to remember a username and password to log in. 
you can verify your identity using your mobile phone number. You are also able to sew via the Cash App. After you've downloaded the app and created an account, tap the Balance tab on your Cash App home screen. Select Add Bank or Add Credit Card and follow the prompts. To give, enter the amount you would like to pay. Tap Pay. Enter our cash tag, dollar sign, Evangel Cathedral. Remember to include your first and last name for records. Enter what the payment is for and tap Pay. We would like to encourage you to consider electronic giving as a more convenient and organized way to give. Thank you for your generosity to our ministry and the kingdom as we continue to spread the love of Jesus Christ.